Deep in the foundations of mathematics lies a simple axiom that produces one of the strangest paradoxes in history. And a direct consequence of this axiom is that not only are there mathematical sets with zero volume, but there are also sets for which it is impossible to assign a meaningful sense of volume. You may already know the formula for the volume of a cylinder or the volume of a cone, but mathematicians have been able to answer a much more general question. Can all mathematical sets be assigned a meaningful volume? In this video, I want to show you how this simple question plays a crucial role in the Banach-Tarski paradox and use it to motivate the study of a fascinating subject known as measure theory. As a brief recap, the Banach-Tarski paradox is a mathematical theorem that says you can take a sphere of a fixed volume, disassemble it into finitely many pieces, then reassemble the pieces to form two spheres of the exact same original size. I made an entire video detailing how this is done, which I'll link below. So you can check that out if you want to see more of the details. But for this video, all you need to know are that these three steps are possible. And despite how counterintuitive it seems, it can be proved mathematically. What I will focus on here is not the precise manner in which this is done, but rather on the logic underlying what's happening in this paradox. How could an object with a fixed volume suddenly seem to appear out of nowhere? And if this is a true mathematical theorem, is there any physical significance to it? We'll see that a satisfactory answer to these questions lies in forming a rigorous definition of volume. The key assumptions behind the Banach-Tarski paradox are the zermelo frankel choice axioms of set theory, or ZFC for short, with the axiom of choice playing an especially significant role. To get a full appreciation of this role, we'll have to consider some of the history of set theory. The origins of set theory lie in the work of the Russian-born mathematician Georg Cantor. Soon after completing his PhD with a dissertation in number theory, Cantor took up a position teaching at the University of Halle in Germany. Here, he began collaborating with other notable mathematicians in Germany. And under the influence of Eduard Heine, his interest turned from number theory to analysis. This seemingly minor shift in focus would eventually cause a revolution in mathematics. In a series of papers written in the 1870s, Cantor developed the main ideas of set theory and considered different sets of numbers like the natural numbers, the rational numbers, and the real numbers. Specifically, he was interested in the size or cardinality of these sets. For a finite set, the cardinality is just the number of elements in the set. But what is the cardinality of the natural numbers? infinity? He knew that there were an infinite amount of real numbers as well. So did these two sets have the same cardinality, or are some infinities greater than others? To answer these questions, Cantor imagined lining up all the natural numbers one by one, and then associating one real number to each natural number. Rather, what he actually did was to associate a unique infinite binary sequence, so a sequence of ones and zeros, to each natural number. And since there's a one-to-one -one map from this set, which I'm just labeling as x, to the real numbers, then the argument naturally extends to the real numbers as well. So now we have an infinite list of natural numbers and binary sequences. And since they are both infinite, we must have written down all of the possibilities, right? The cardinality of both sets appears to be the same. But Cantor proved an astonishing result. It is impossible to have captured all of the binary sequences. You can write down a sequence of ones and zeros that is not in this list. All we need to do is to go through each sequence and choose one number differently. So for the first number, we'll change the first entry. The second number, change the second entry. The third number, the third entry, and so on. If it's a one, we'll change it to a zero. And if it's a zero, we'll change it to a one. And at the end of this infinite process, we will have written down a sequence that is not on the list because it differs from every other sequence by at least one number. So there must be more binary sequences than there are natural numbers. Not all infinities are equal. Cantor called these two infinities countable infinity and uncountable infinity. And since there exists a bijection between the real numbers and the set X, Cantor's proof showed that the set of real numbers is uncountable as well. Despite the glowing praise that Cantor received from Hilbert, he was not without his critics. 
The debate surrounding Cantor's infinity and set theory proved to be an extremely fruitful period for mathematics, however, ultimately leading to Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead's work, The Principia, where they attempted to place mathematics on secure, logical foundations. This was followed by the revolutionary work of Kurt Gödel, showing that the entire project was doomed to failure when he proved his two incompleteness theorems. Amidst all this, Ernst Zermelo realized that in order to fully resolve the logical paradoxes that plagued Cantor's original formulation of set theory, it would need to be axiomatized. A critical insight of Zermelo's was that something called the well-ordering principle, which Cantor took to be an intuitively obvious law of thought, was actually something that could be derived from more basic principles. The well-ordering principle states that every set can be well-ordered. That is, for a given set S, any non-empty subset must have a least element. As time passed, Cantor came to believe that the well-ordering principle should be derived from more basic principles as well, and he even attempted to find his own proof of it, but failed to do so. Where Cantor failed, however, Zermelo succeeded. In the process of spelling out the foundational principles underlying his proof of the well-ordering principle, Zermelo formulated the first axiomatized version of set theory. A few years later, Thorolf Skolem, Abraham Frankel, and John von Neumann each contributed to finalizing what has become the standard foundations of mathematics accepted by most mathematicians, the Zermelo-Frankel choice axioms, or ZFC. So Zermelo was able to show that the well-ordering principle can be proved from these axioms, and specifically what it required was the axiom of choice. This axiom has various equivalent formulations, but the version Zermelo initially used was this one. Any collection of non-empty sets has a choice function. So no matter how small or large the collection is, even if it's countably or uncountably infinite, there is always some way to choose an element from each set. And although this axiom seemed innocent enough, it would turn out to have many surprising consequences. One of which is that there are sets that cannot be assigned any notion of volume. To be more mathematically precise, there are sets which are non-measurable. Alongside all these developments in set theory, another mathematical theory known as measure theory was being developed, which sought to define a rigorous, abstract concept of volume that could apply not just to objects in various dimensions, but to any mathematical sets. There were many key figures that contributed to the creation of it, but Henri Lebesgue is often considered the father of measure theory, due to the critical work he did in formulating the Lebesgue measure and the Lebesgue integral. In my next video, I plan to explain in detail what a measure is, but as a short intuitive understanding, it will suffice to note that a measure is a mathematically precise function that assigns a real number greater than or equal to zero to subsets of some larger set S. It doesn't assign a real number to all of the subsets, however, but only to those subsets that are part of a collection called a sigma algebra. So there will only be some of the subsets for which we can assign a measure to. Any subset of S that is not in the sigma algebra will be non-measurable. And the most famous example of a set that contains subsets which are non-measurable is the sphere. This is where we connect back to Banach Tarski. Remember how one sphere was taken apart, rearranged, and put back together to form two spheres? The reason this is possible is because the sphere is broken apart into a finite number of pieces. In fact, there is a proof that it can be broken into as little as five pieces. But there is always at least one piece that must be non-measurable. So although the sphere begins with a specific volume V and ends as two spheres with the same volume, along the way we have introduced sets that have no volume whatsoever. These sets are so intricately constructed that any attempt to assign a measure to them would result in a logical contradiction. Therefore, whatever operations have been performed along the way, the volume has not been properly conserved. So not only can we turn this one sphere into two, we could even turn a small pebble into a star by repeatedly applying this process. Of course, only in an abstract way. Since the process necessarily involves objects with no conceivable volume, the Banach-Tarski paradox cannot possibly apply to the real world.